Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. About Us. The Business of Creating was co-founded by writer-producer Jennifer Mangan and entertainment marketing executive Michael Fisk. The Business of Creating is an ongoing live interactive panel series and Q&A with seasoned entertainment executives. Our purpose is to educate and to empower professionals who already possess foundational knowledge by providing up-to-the-minute useful information and practical action steps in order to create, finance, market, sell, and distribute top-quality projects. We've already produced and moderated over 30 panels, and here's a sampling of previous ones, including creating ripos, sizzles, and other marketing materials, creating digital marketing campaigns, producing your project, distribution for indie projects, unit photography, animation, financing your project one and two, and developing your project strategies to implement during COVID. To watch some of these panels and to find out more, Follow us on socials. You can find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and of course our website, businessofcreating.org. Thank you to our sponsors, Second Home, the Writers Guild Foundation. Business of Creating is an all-volunteer nonprofit organization. We rely on sponsors to help cover our costs and keep events free for everyone who wishes to attend. If you can sponsor or know somebody who can, please reach out to us either through socials or at our website, businessofcreating.org. Or look us up directly on Venmo at Business of Creating. Um, first of all, I want to say it's great to see some very familiar faces. So thank you very much for our, our, our friends who come and join us on some of these panels. Um, and then also seeing some new faces as well. Um, the, the, the few things, and also we have, we have friends from across the seas who are actually um, here. <laughs> so, and, uh, coming from afar, you know, um, not just for this panel. <laughs> so, um, but we wanted to kind of start off with, I wanted to say a few things is, it's really interesting because Jen actually was wise to put in the parentheses once the strike is over because first of all, we're so happy that the strike is over and we're so happy for the writers for the writers and screen actors. It's, you know, it's so wonderful. It's been a tough, tough, tough summer for everybody, you know, particularly, particularly for Writers Guild and SAG. We know it's not over until it's over, you know, type of thing. We put these together as educational panels so that you learn and you can figure out how to make your projects become reality, whether they're TV projects or film projects. And, you know, this is all about also helping each other, right? You know, and while we have this downtime to help each other on this thing, and then once the strike is over, we can really begin. And that's where really, we've been always been doing these panels around that. We, we kind of will we'll talk about what is there. You know, part of what we do here, we want to encourage people to network with one another, you know, beforehand and afterwards. I mean, you can network during, but you know, it's like a little loud. And so what we really do is because you never know if you can afterwards or even beforehand, you know, look to the person to your right, look to the person to your left, introduce each other because you never know when they might be the ones that are helping you and vice versa. You know, because this industry really is about, I mean, it's not as, you can never get anything done alone on yourself. Um, a little bit about the business of creating is that was founded by Jennifer Mangan and I five, six, seven years ago. Yeah, seven, six. I was like, <laughs> it just keeps on creeping up. We've done over 30 of these panels and it really started off, you know, trying to make our community stronger. And I'll explain a little bit when I introduce Jen, how we got to know each other. But we really cover a variety of topics. Oh, there we are. Hit each other. I know. Um, we cover a variety of topics. I mean, obviously we do stuff on producing, financing. We, the last time was on film festivals. We've done unit photography. Is it worth even introduce, like, working with influencers? What's that about? How do you publicize it? You know, anything about like the business of being able to create your projects and make them successful. So, and also we're always open to new ideas. If you have a topic, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, I want to learn more about this. Let us know, you know, and then we can try to figure out if we can put a panel around it together. 
um, done talking that first part. Now we get into the fun stuff, which is why you're here. Um, I'm going to just do a quick introduction of Jen, my dear friend, and she is a writer producer of Beautiful Day Productions, and um, she, what she's founded that to actually make content, you know, that empowers women and really inspirational, entertaining content out there. We actually met years ago and she reached out to me to see if I would actually help on um, one of the projects because she actually founded the Women in Film Mini Upfronts and which was trying to get make sure that projects by women were going to be seen and get talent and management. And she asked me to kind of actually do some, um, it was really interesting, like the judging some of the trailers. And we found out like, hey, wait, how do you actually do trailers and sizzle reels and ripplematics? And Jen's like, why don't we do a panel? Yeah. And because of that, this is this is why this all began. And um, I know I'm just gonna read a little, just a little bit about Jen because I, I, I know her more so personally, I have to kind of get more of the professional version of it. Um, you know, but she graduated with distinction from UCLA Extension in business and management entertainment. And we talked about how she founded the Women Many Upfronts. Um, she also really re need, sees a need for creatives to gain practical advice. And that's a key thing you'll see here very often with our panels is, you know, this is not about just a bunch of people sitting up here and telling war stories, which is, which is by the way, a lot of fun. You know, it's like very entertaining. But at the end of the day, you walk away and you're like, okay, how does that help me with my TV project? How does that help me with my film? And so we, that's where we try to get into the practicalities of this. Um, and so that's, you know, that's what we try to do and also make sure it's, we can market and sell the products. Um, currently, Jen is actually um, working on a sci-fi fantasy TV show called Animal Magnetism. So with that, I'm going to pass over the microphone to Jen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for coming on this beautiful evening to learn all about producing and developing projects in a large IP and reboot world once the strike is finally resolved. <sighs> Big breath. All right, you guys, we've got some incredible people up here tonight that I get to learn from and everybody gets to learn from. Ladies and gentlemen, first up, we have Chris Ryle. Yeah, come on in, Chris. Chris is the co-founder and publisher at Syzygy Publishing publishing an imprint of uh, image comics uh, that launched in January 2022 uh, with the Eisner nominated Joe Hill's Rain. He is also the writer and co-creator of Syzygy titles Zombies vs. Robux, Onyx, The Hollows, and Tales of Suspense, among other titles. Prior to forming Syzygy, Ryle spent Nearly two decades developing unique stories from multiple sides of the business. In 2004, he joined comic book publisher IDW Publishing as the company's editor-in-chief and developed hundreds of original properties as both editor and writer. He worked with creators Joe Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez in the development of Lock and Key, serving as the editor on the acclaimed comic series and as an executive producer on its three-season Netflix run. In 2010, he was named IDW's first chief creative officer as he was instrumental in forming publishing partnerships with high profile licensors such as Hasbro, Nickelodeon, Universal, Disney, Lucasfilm, and many more. He left IDW in late 2017 to join Robert Kirkman and David Alpert's Skybound Entertainment as their editor-in-chief of special projects before jumping back to IDW as the company's president, publisher, and CCO. The man moves around, y'all. Look how fit this man is. In addition to Syzygy Publishing, uh, Chris is also the EP on the BBC Studios in development, Eve Stranger. He's the co-creator, co-EP of a new scripted series in development at Paramount and author of the 2024 Abrams Comics Arts release, The Mighty Marvel Calendar Book, A Visual History. Everybody, I can't wait to learn from this man. Welcome, Chris Ryle. Oh, grab a seat, my friend. Grab a seat. I would have totally cut that down if I knew she was going to read it all. Thanks for listening to all of that. Okay, hey, the panel's over. No. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my finance guru extraordinaire, it's Xavier L. Byers. Woo! Xavier was born and raised in Augusta, Georgia. He attended Morehouse College, where he graduated with a bachelor's in business administration and began his career at Turner Broadcasting as a summer intern in finance, where he would eventually support CNN, the Cartoon Network, and Adult Swim. In 2014, Xavier accepted a position with Warner Brothers and moved to LA, hallelujah for that one, 
because he's here tonight because of that. So since moving, Xavier became active with the Black Employee Professional Group that he chaired for three years over at Warner Brothers, where he successfully curated diversity and inclusion events and supported film and TV projects with senior leaders. Currently, Xavier is the production finance executive at Netflix and serves on their film DNI Council. Xavier continues to be driven by opportunities to collaborate and move the culture forward while remaining passionate and committed to the elevation of creative content. Everybody, let's welcome Xavier! Okay, you guys, and if I had to choose a favorite, it's my partner in crime, Michael Fisk! Michael is, of course, the co- Yay, yes, please applaud, please applaud. <laughs> Michael is the co-founder of Business of Creating Panel Series. He is a senior marketing executive in the entertainment industry, having spearheaded over, you're hearing this correctly, 500 marketing campaigns for studios like Sony Pictures, Lionsgate, NBC Universal, Warner Brothers, and most recently for MGM Amazon. He is the co-founder of Pangram Entertainment, which develops and produces TV and film and distributes content from international markets. Most recently, he released the Chinese language sports drama Breaking Through. That was this summer in LA and New York, and it was a super fun movie to go see. Uh, in addition to this, he also runs Intermark, the international consulting practice focusing on helping filmmakers, producers, directors, and distributors with long-term marketing, strategy, and producing. His passion is indeed making your passion project succeed. And we have a couple of fun facts. His yeah, I had to include uh, them. Yeah. I, I, I wish me I cut those out. <laughs> <laughs> We've done too many panels. <laughs> okay, so some of his favorite marketing campaigns that he's worked on are the James Bond franchises. He worked on the last six ones of those. Spider-Man, uh, a few of the Damien Chazelle films like Whiplash and La La Land. And don't hold it against him, but even the pleasure movie, the guilty pleasure movie, Paul Blart, Mall Cop. Yeah. Everybody welcome Michael. Yes, yes, I'm going to sit on this side. All right, you guys, I can't wait to learn from these people. This is going to be awesome. Pick a microphone there. That's right, mic drop. I did it now. <laughs> How can we move forward better than what we've just done with our intros? Okay, let's start us off, you guys. Types of projects tonight. We're looking at original concepts. We're looking at IP-based, reboot-based, and, well, we'll go over those a little bit. And then, you know, hey, my original concept, can I turn it into existing IP? Do I want to? Tell me more. Okay, well, original concepts, we know what those are, right? Original, we've thought of them ourselves. They're not based on anything else. IP-based, what is IP-based? What do we mean by that, guys? Uh, yeah, he's, he's, good. he's good at the IP. He's good at the... Chris, right, tell I mean, me. Yeah, the IP is intellectual property. It's an existing property that, uh, you know, you try to find different ways to extend it in, you know, whether it's TV shows, film, novels, comic books, and so on. And so when we're looking at IP-based, I mean, I think of like either graphic novels slash comic books or like young adult novels. Uh, what am I missing? What else would be considered existing IP in that then? I, I mean, at this point in the entertainment sphere, um, board games, um, uh, food okay. products. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like everything is yeah, Toys. being turned into. Toys. Yeah. Oh, hello. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay, and I would presume also like Oppenheimer then, based on, you know, real people. Would that be IP as well, or? I mean, he was certainly an intellectual. I don't know if he would consider himself as a property, but, but sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, there you go. Ouch. Okay, so now reboot-based. Reboot-based. What are we looking at there? Actually taking existing IP, like all the things that you just named, and creating a fresh new story for it, right? What happens with Wednesday Adams, right? Taking a property that probably wasn't in theaters since the early 90s and bringing it, bringing it to series and giving her an entire world um, based around her experiences as a teenager. That's refreshing or rebooting. Ah, uh, okay. IP. So you could just be taking it as well from a different character's point of view and their specific world even though it's based on something, uh, you know, previously known. Yes. 
Yeah, I mean, talking about like your James Bond campaign, James Bond is certainly a piece of IP that has been rebooted and refreshed mm -hmm. and renewed over and over again. Yeah, you guys, because you do, you almost have to do it every single time they bring a new James Bond, you know, and that way they start a new story, they reboot it. Um, it's interesting because there's always a, a, a nuance of like, is a, what's a reboot sounds like, okay, you're taking something that was there that was kind of forgotten or kind of dormant, you know, and bringing that forward. Like a remake is very similar, you know, it's nuanced, you know, but you're just kind of like, it could be more current, but they're just kind of remaking it, you know, in a, in a different path. So it's, but sometimes they're interchangeable. Yeah, just an interesting point that I want to bring up is right now in Hollywood, all of the studios are grabbing at IP, right? Everything that we know existing from Hot Wheels to Barbie <laughs> to the Addams Family. And so a lot of times as, new, as, as creatives, you're like, where do I fit into this world, right? Um, for writers, I know a lot of you spend time doing spec scripts. That's a great way to showcase that, hey, bring me in-house, bring me on this project. I can refresh this brand. I can do something on your existing IP. Maybe you do your, your research and you say, oh, okay, Warner Brothers Discovery just acquired X IP. What can I do to write a, a brand new story or a series or a movie for that? But I bring this up because the point that I really wanted to make is, has everyone heard of the new Gran Turismo movie that just came out this summer? That's an interesting film from a business model standpoint for the industry and this may be something worth looking into taking an existing story a new story a clip right and actually like marrying it to a brand that relates to the news clip and actually making a full movie out of it so the young man spoiler alert <laughs> but the young man um he basically trained off of playing this PlayStation video game. This is not that Sony looked to make a movie off of Gran Turismo. This was real life news that happened and some writer was able to take that story and turn it into uh, an actually uh, a pretty good movie. And I also just add another, another thing on IP is people very often forget. It's like you can actually get um, IP from magazines. So, for example, um, when I was at Lionsgate, there was a movie that we did about the firefighters that lost their lives there. That was based on a newspaper or actually a magazine article. If you also, if you think, go even further back, if you look at Brokeback Mountain, that was actually uh, uh, an article in The New Yorker that then was adapted into, into a movie. So when we're saying IP, it's kind of something that's existing out there that's not coming from directly from your brain that has not ever been seen or read or, you know, viewed before, you know, and that's kind of, it's a very, very broad thing. I think very often people think IP is just as a, a big brand like Barbie, but it actually can be just like even small articles that are out there that people really resonated with. To finish up on this slide then, so since we are having such a nice broad definition of existing IP, can I turn my original concept into some form of existing IP? And do I want to? Is that advantageous? I've stumped them. Well, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, here's the thing is, I think, you know, as creators, most are like, oh my God, I want this to be an IP so you can actually do another one, right? Like you want it to be successful and to create it. I think, you know, the hard part is that when it's an original idea and it's never been seen or heard before, you know, I mean, tech, you know, I guess in the technical legal term, it is intellectual property. But when we're using it here in this, for the sake of this panel and for the sake of the industry, when they're talking about it, they're thinking of always, is this IP already known, right? You have an unknown one. Your goal is very often to make it a known one. I mean, there are, there, I mean, it's hard to say, you know, you know, for a fact, like what you want it to be. Very often, there's a lot of projects out there that are like, it's a one and done thing. It's not meant to be sequels and beaten to death, right? Like it's a one story to be for, which is perfect, right? It becomes the IP. But very often people are looking for, the studios very often are looking for projects that are, that can be that IP. I mean, there's so many times where we worked on movies that were like, oh my God, they're gonna have a sequel. They're gonna do TV spinoffs. They're gonna do all these things. And that's the goal. And they invested into it because of the goal. And when you're going and pitching your idea, assuming that it is, can be a sequel, you want to actually say that because then it kind of shows there's that revenue stream that comes out beyond it. I mean, you know, unfortunately, if it doesn't do well, then it kind of stays there, you know, then it's as that one. But that's kind of like some of the thinking, you know, for you as creators to think about, you know, what your project is meant to be. And that's that only you can really answer. Yeah, 
Yeah, I was going to to add to that. Um, I think the danger is, as on the creative side, is trying to think too big for your project at the start. You know, I, I think trying to aim for IP rather than just telling a good story, whether it's in a comic book or TV picture or film, what have you, um, is dangerous because then you start you start building too grandiose, too big, too unmanageable of a world right from the start, which kind of scares everybody away. Even, you know, it even happens on the, the, like at the Ron Howard level where the idea was, we're gonna do Dark Tower as a series of films and in between there will be these TV series. And it just, it sort of collapses under its own weight before you've made the one thing that can kind of prove that there is more life in that piece of IP. Um, I mean, an even bigger example is probably the Dark Universe, which is, you know, Universal spent a lot of money on this this 10 plus year plan without really nailing the first movie and sort of building organically from there. So I think on the creative side, get the good idea, figure out the best way to tell that story. Again, whether it's prose, comic books, TV, film, and then you sort of let the marketplace dictate the, the IP value of what you created. Yeah, and just to piggyback off what Chris said, everything that you all create is IP. Um, so get that idea out there first. Be in the position to sit down with the studio one day so that you can you can may help make that decision. Like, do I want this to be larger IP or was this just a one-off? Or maybe I have another project that'll be better to build a universe off of. Um, but everything that you create is your intellectual property. Because from a business standpoint, something that I, th I think people don't realize is that every TV show, every movie, every pilot, every... Uh, animation um, <laughs> it's a it's it's a business we literally have to stand everything up as a business so that 30 years from now great example is the, the movie the Christmas story it was a small indie movie filmed in Canada <laughs> that was just someone's story of this is what Christmas was like in my household who knew that 30 years later we'd be showing it on TNT for 24 hours every Christmas, right? But it's a full business that has to stand up. Um, and so that's why I just want to make it known that, um, like Chris was saying, like everything that you all create is IP. Um, so just put yourself in that position to make the full decision when you sit down with studios of bigger IP or just a one-off. And can I just say also what, what Chris was saying is that, you know, when, when you do talk about, let's say you want to license and merchandise and TV and spinoffs and, you know, graphic novels and so on, if your focus is on that part and not your story, that's going to be a problem, right? You know, so usually in, in pitch decks, for example, you put all that kind of like at the end and by the, it's more of like, here's this wonderful IP that you want them to buy into. And then, okay, here's the opportunities that can go downstream, you know, but it's at the end. You know, very often I, I've made this mistake myself where I was like, I got so caught up in, in, oh my God, look at the big picture and how it could be here in five, 10 years, you know, and then you're just like, wait, I have to kind of go back to what is actually, you know, you have to have that success with the first thing. So that's one thing just to note. And, and then Xavier, it was interesting you were saying about like how you create, like you're trying to create IP and it reminded me a little bit about actually with, David Boer, um, who's sitting back there, you know, with a panel that, you know, Jen helped put together with, you know, trying to create IP. And there was discussion about how do you take a TV project and film and make it into a graphic novel and vice versa. So you might have projects, you know, you can actually create, you know, you might have this idea and get it out in other ways and have it as an IP in a different format and then kind of boomerang to another platform, right? You know, it's like, so I know there was that entire panel that was discussing about this which is on our YouTube channel. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, it, it, it's great to have the plan for what you might do with spinoffs or prequels or what have you, but yeah, when you start pitching it that way, you can sort of see, the same way a great white shark's eyes will roll back when he's about to go into the attack, you can see the, the development exec's eyes just roll back and you've, you've lost him for good. So just sort of start with the thing and then let it sort of build out organically. I gotta say, I'm sitting here and I see Xavier kind of go, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god it's fantastic i hope we can get a close-up you know in the edit <laughs> all right so now that we've talked about all of that i don't have a script yet i have a concept i have an idea how am i going to pitch that how am i going to win the executives over and what yeah how do i pitch this if i've only got an idea what do i need everybody how can i do this practical steps number one number two I mean, you need more than an idea. Like that's that's a great thing to build from, but you really need to have a sense of 
And like again, a lot of what I where I'm coming from is from the graphic novel side. Like I've certainly pitched TV shows and things, but a lot of my background is on the comic book graphic novel development side. And so if I make too many references to that medium, know that a lot of it is translatable to film, TV, and what have you. Um, so if somebody came to me and said they just had an idea for a thing, I, I go, well, yeah, the idea is a thing, but then what are the characters? What What is the story? What is the arc? What is what is the story you're trying to tell? What are the themes you really want to nail? You know, you, there's a lot more work that has to be done once you have the idea. That's, that's kind of your starting place, but then you really need to build out that roadmap of plotting out what you want to do with the story, who the main characters are. Um, and the other thing that I think a lot of people don't focus on because they get very focused on plot and characters and even thematic elements, but they don't necessarily think about tone. And tone is where I've seen a lot of people trip up in pitch meetings because they have this thing and they know in their head that it's it's kind of comedic, but you really need to have that define. Like, what does that mean? Is it slapstick? Is it a dramedy? If it's a dramedy, how much humor versus how much drama? Like. I think tone is a thing that people really get uh, caught on where they don't necessarily know what that story is or how they want to tell it. And so you just kind of need to build build a roadmap that has all of those different elements in it. And then once you sort of have a clear picture of what the story is, where you want to go with it, how you want to tell it, I think that's when you can really start thinking about how to craft a pitch. Yeah, and just to piggyback off what Chris said, um, Stepping into the room with development executives, I'm not a development executive, but I can tell you, I'm going to tell you guys a few things. Um, number one, they're fans of the industry too. They write, they direct, they produce outside of actually being the people that receive creatives to make decisions. So play into that. Um, to Chris's point, like on the creative side, know about different act structures, know about your story arc, know about the universe that you're trying to create, right? If they ask you a question about a specific character that doesn't get that much highlight in your in your pitch deck or in the, your, your script that you submitted, be able to talk about that character, right? But also on the business side, be able to, to, to share comps. And what I mean by comps is what's comparable. Um, because that really speaks to the language of the numbers in their head that they're not really gonna tell you about. But when you sit there and you're like, Oh, this is going to be close to, you know that show Abbott Elementary on ABC? This is going to kind of be like that. It's going to be, we're going to do multi-cam. It's going to look like a reality school. When you start speaking the industry of this is how we're actually going to make this happen, I think that can help your, your actual pitch because it shows that you are a student of this industry, not just that I have this great idea and I can write well and pitch well, but also sometimes we read scripts for films and it's like, we're gonna film this and there's this scene in, in Tokyo and then there's this scene in Nepal and then there's this scene in Antarctica. And those numbers are going through those execs' heads. <laughs> like, are we doing CGI? Are we doing yeah. the digital stage? Like, are we actually flying people out? And so just being aware of your idea from a business standpoint will also help you master that pitch meeting. Yeah, and can, can I just add, add, add on to what they said too is, you know, we as humans, it's interesting, when you are confronted with something you have not read or seen before, you're like sitting there with this blank and you're trying to figure out where to compartmentalize it into your brain, right? Like, and I'll give you an example. It's like, I, I've been given many scripts and I remember I'm reading it and I remember someone's like, this is a comedy, I'm reading it. Thank God they said, they start off with comedy. So at least when you get into it, you're reading it, you understand it's a comedy, right? And I remember at, after I, I talked about it and what I thought about the script, you know, the, the screenwriter was like, well, it's actually really a drama. And I was like, I was like, well, you can't, like, you can't like bait and switch me on this, you know, because I've been reading it as a comedy, and I mean, I could see what he was talking about, but I'm like, you've just lost me entirely, you know. And I think that's where when Xavier's talking about the comps is really important. And there's like kind of like I, I list there's like two types of comps. There's the comps, you know, when we say comps, it's comparative titles, you know. So when we're saying it's like, is it? It's like, for example, there's this project I'm working on where I'm saying it's Men in Black meets Space Jam, right? <laughs> the writer, he's like, well, it's not, it's really not like Space Jam. My, my screen, you know, script is all different. And I'm like, I'm like, yes, your script is different. All of us, all of our scripts are different, right? You know, it's, it's unique. But I can't go into a pitch meeting, you know, and say your script, uh, we're going to say your script is different. But, you know, when you're talking to people, they have to understand when you hear Men in Black with aliens and, and Space Jam, you kind of already know this family-friendly genre with aliens, right? You kind of already know what that's going to be. 
you kind of have to kind of set the stage so that when you start pitching it, people understand what you're trying to do. So that's the one part of the comps. The other one is the business aspect that you're talking about, Xavier. Is like, are you, you know, because <laughs> I've had one, you know, you know, certain creators are like, it's going to be like Avatar and a billion dollars. I'm like, yeah, don't we all? You know, it's like, it's not, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to happen, right? You know, it's like you have to have something realistic because you will be laughed out of the room, you know, if it's not a realistic comp, you know, and because then it just does, it shows that you're just not even understanding of where, where your project should be fitting within it, within the budget, because that's what the first thing they're going to be doing is, you know, thinking about where does this fit on a genre tone side, but then also where does it fit from a business side? Is it is okay to have different type of comps, you know, more of like it feels this in tonally and this type of genre, and then having the more business ones, that's fine, just have to be very clear about it. To just add a quick follow-up question on that, uh, because I know the rule used to be, hey, they need to be within the last five years, all of your comps. But now that with COVID and everything, that kind of got, you know, you know, thrown out. Um, is that still the case? Or, you know, is, is it more favorable to have more recent ones? Or is it fine to have a bit of, you know, an amalgamation of several? Because you're like, hey, man, these are the current ones. But you'll also notice that throughout the different years and decades, this has always been a successful genre, story style, blah, blah, blah. I mean, to me, the, the, the key to any kind of cop is you're basically trying to minimize the risk for them to take a chance on your piece of IP. So it's you're trying to basically trick them into taking something new and thinking that it's something that already exists in some way. So yes, it's a new idea, but it's very comparable to this and this, which are both successful ideas. And so you're not taking a chance on something wholly new, but you're taking a chance on something that is just new enough, but very comparable to these things that you can see that there was a very clear, successful track record. Like you don't want to just pick comps that are so obscure and or unsuccessful that you go, oh, I don't want to do another one of those. <laughs> right, and I think, I think it shows, to your point, I think it shows that you're a fan of the industry. Again, I'm going to play into that, like the fandom. Fans like to be around other fans. Like, eh, I don't like this script, Thomas. But you said Raiders of the Lost Ark, and that's like classic, right? Um, not, but don't just mention something old. But <laughs> I think you bring it. I think you show both. I think you show some old and some new if it's comparable. Because um, you also don't want to throw something out there that people possibly haven't seen. And I think I think that's the thing is is that I think if you're doing a you know from a tonal perspective of what where it fits you can go back if you're trying to show from a business perspective of how much money it makes that's where it is a little tricky now like you know COVID threw everything off but you don't want to go too far back to people are saying you know things are totally different before COVID and after COVID right so that's why it's you have to kind of be clear of what the comp is used for and I, I agree with you also you know don't <laughs> Unless you're talking to really like a tour filmmakers who understand, you know, abstract, you know, comparative titles, which sometimes you do, you know, you could maybe one of them. If they don't know what the comp is, then it might as well not even have it, you know, because they can't even put in their mind of where that fits. I think in general, just sort of just play out the conversation in your head a bit. Like if you compare your idea to Pulp Fiction, what that's going to do is have them think, well, you're not Tarantino yet. And you're also then comparing yourself to Eight Heads in a Duffel Bag and every other sort of failed Tarantino-ish sort of idea, but if you pick an old property like Goonies is one that I think feels ripe for remake or adaptation or some sort of comparison to. Um, so picking an older film like that that hasn't been done to death or copied, you know, ad finitum, um, I think that kind of example is also good, even if it's you know a couple decades old. I'm so glad you said that because I actually used Goonies recently as a comp. So. <laughs> I that one. Oh, I was, trying, I was like, oh, thank God, you. I hope y'all wrote that down. Always use good. Always use good. Okay. All right. Take that note down now. This just brings up another interesting point uh, to what Chris was saying. Know who you're going into the meeting with, um, because what development execs talk about a lot of the times is great pitch, wrong studio, wrong network. We can't do anything with this. And so, like, hey, if you're doing, if you're gonna do, if you're doing comedy and it's a single cam show or let's say a multi cam show, which we know there are not as many multi cam shows in comedy as there used to be, what networks are still doing multi cam shows? Make sure that your meetings are with those networks as opposed to a network that's like, eh, we don't, we don't do multi cam anymore, because um, then it feels like a waste of time. So just really do your research about the 
your tone, your genre of what it is that you're creating, and also who you <laughs> want to get into business with. Okay, a lot of homework going on after we leave this night. Uh, we've got a couple of you know lovely phrases up there, which probably a lot of us know, but things to have. We have our lookbook, we have our mood board, we have pitch deck and pitch document, and ah, perhaps a ripomatic or sizzle reel. And we've mentioned a lot of those throughout this conversation right now where we're talking with our pitch document and pitch deck, where we're saying, okay, make sure you know who the characters are, who the, what the tone is, what your comps are. That's all going, of course, in your pitch document and your deck. Uh, do we need to talk about what a lookbook is, mood board? Kind of similar as far as like showing off your tone and your style and who you think, you know, comp actors, et cetera. Yeah, they're really sim similar, but I, for me, I really love like to get the tone of what it is that you're creating. Because I can get into the numbers, we can break down how much this is gonna cost, but if you can tell me that this is going to be like this, and this character is like this character, um, I think that really just it gives clarity all around. And do you find you know that it's important for somebody to make like a ribomatic or a sizzle reel to go with? You know, that be out there being like your two minute trailer? Um, honestly, it depends on where you are in the process. If you have it, it's a nice to have. There's always, it's always great to have more things than not. Um, just like it's always great to have more than one project. So that if they, they hurry up and go through the first project and you're like, oh, that's my baby. But I also have this, or some joke is made about people aren't doing comedies anymore. And you're like, oh, but I have a job. I think the extra stuff can help. Yeah, I mean, I certainly think a lookbook or or a mood board that shows sort of the setting, the feel, the yeah, the look that you really want for your project is important. Um, the one thing on the sizzle, I I've sort of seen it go awry. In fact, it went awry for me. Um, I had an animation project, and we had this animation studio that we were partnered with, who they weren't able to finance it, but they were able to do a ninety second sizzle for us. That was just to show kind of a proof of concept, but not the look that we uh, envisioned for the animated series itself. But the problem with that is once you've shown a thing, that thing gets cemented in a lot of people's heads as, well, that's the look they want. That's not for us. We don't want this. And so it kind of also, to your point about knowing who you're pitching to, it can really depend on the audience. Like if they don't understand that what you're doing is just kind of give them a flavor, a sense of the characters or how, you know, there are magical elements in this animation pitch. Um, and we wanted to show that in an animated way, but it wasn't it wasn't what we wanted the final look to be. But one of the pitches, they couldn't get it out of their head that we showed them a thing that wasn't the final thing that we wanted. And they said, well, that doesn't fit. That's not the right look for us. And so sometimes you just have to kind of be wary of that, too. Wait, with, okay. Yeah, because in animation, like when you said that, is it because it was more of like, because it was the final product, right? And was this more of like a sketch and kind of showing? I mean, it know? was pretty finished because we it wanted was, to give okay. a sense of, of that we could finish a thing and not have it just be, you know, line art. But the problem with that was, yeah, it, it locked in their heads that that was the look we wanted. And so, again, it just, you just sort of need people with the vision to sort of see beyond, or at least just to listen to what you're telling them. Um, it doesn't always happen that way. Okay, you guys, having said that, that was the first slide. First slide. So we're going to go now. That was the concept. You know, now we're talking about what if you have the script? So basically, I, I believe we've kind of covered it as far as like, all right, how is that different when you actually have the script as opposed to simply the concept? We've got more material ready to go. We got 100 pages ready to email over to you. <laughs> I have found that the more you build up front and the less sort of decision or or notes that that the other side can give you the more it can kind of work against you um if you have a script that's great leading with that maybe isn't great um you know certainly if you pitch a thing you have your your treatment or what have you and they say yeah i'd love to see a script i'd love to see a scene i'd love to see something more send me that but to lead with a thing that requires somebody to read 90 or 120 pages is very likely to not get read or it just like I say it doesn't it doesn't give them a lot of room to give notes and so I like to kind of I like to get people asking questions tell me what comes next what happens with this character you go well funny you should ask I also have this but to give too much right up front can be sort of daunting or just get you know locked. time is limited and so you try to be very um, 
thoughtful of other people's time. So, yeah. So, so something new that I've seen, like in the past, well, pre-strike in the past couple of months, um, is that writers will actually say, "Hey, here goes five pages of my script," and development execs will actually take the time because like, they can get through that, right? Um, but that requires you all to know what are the best five pages. <laughs> What's going to pull them in? Like, what are the best five pages of the script? So that I always pick like, five from random <laughs> points in the script. Because <laughs> you, because you do want them. You want them to email you back and say, "Hey, I want to like, what happens to this character? Or uh, I want to know more about this. Or can you just sum up or tell me like what's going on?" So that's just a new strategy that I've seen be successful for people. You all have friends and network of people who can get things to people that make those decisions, that may be a, a great approach, um, especially if you're doing it over email. And so to follow up on that, it can be the first five pages, but it could be pages 12 through 17 or whatever else, whatever really makes makes the light the fire. Yeah, I, I think as long as you give real explanation to like, what is that world? Because again, you're showing your mastery of what it is that you're presenting. <clears throat> Okay. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> no, because it's true. And I, I also just to um, kind of say too, is like the script, I mean, 120 pages is a long, you know, a lot of time task for people. And, you know, what I've seen work effectively is it's almost like there was these phase, it's almost like when you're kind of like fishing, you know, and you, you're trying to like hook them in and then you kind of have to reel it in and then you have to take them out, you know, to put, pull them out of the water into the boat, right? The hooking them in is like if you can get them in like very often if there's like kind of a one page or a one sheet almost like a sales sheet of like just overall it's the genre the comps a log line you know who's kind of attached to it what is it about you know maybe some maybe an image that kind of fits with it because if if they're not even interested in the genre you're not they're not gonna like look even a pitch deck now if they like just even just the overall idea kind of like a sales sheet of you know one pager then you're saying okay now do you want to look at my 10, 20, 50 page pitch deck or whatever it might be. And then you can go from there. And then if they're really interested into it, you're like, here's the script, right? You know, and that's kind of like kind of this phased approach. You kind of hook them in with a one p one pager, you get them in with the pitch deck kind of start reeling it in. And then if they're asking for the script, then you will basically have them in the boat, right? You know, on that level. Um, but it's, you know, it's kind of a hard, but it's, is that, the way every single time no you know it's like if there's m multiple ways you don't have a pitch deck it doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to still do it you know but it just seemed that effective which is smart because if you do send a full script they're not going to read it anyway they're going to read a summary that somebody in their office wrote and so it's better if that one sheet comes from you than somebody that is reading for them yeah, okay you guys you just made people cry and leave <laughs> <laughs> i'm just saying i'm just saying what we're all thinking right now <laughs> We've been talking about it, so but uh, what else do we need to create the successful pitch? What elements do we need? So, so for me, so I had sold a TV show to Paramount um, early on in the pandemic, and so I'm only mentioning that as a way to sort of base it on what I used to build the pitch out, which was I started with the log line, so it's basically a one sentence or can be a couple sentence descriptor of what the show is. Um, and then it sort of got into, again, very briefly – why the show should exist now, um, why we're the right ones to tell this story, what the theme is, what the plot, the, the sort of overarching plot is, who the lead characters are. And then I went into real detailed fashion of what the pilot would be. So here's the first episode, very detailed. And then just a couple more paragraphs to detail out what the rest of the season would be, sort of what the arc for each of the main characters would be in that first season. And then even more briefly, I mentioned, like, if there's a season two, we would cover this. If there's a season three, we would cover this. And so the part I spent the most time on was really that pilot, which is kind of the thing that establishes your setting, your tone, your characters, um, and the, the theme, everything you're trying to accomplish with what will unfold over the whole season. And then the rest of the season details are much briefer than that. But, you know, just trying to basically make sure – it, it touched on every possible thing that they might want to get a sense of, you know, what the show is and also why we're the right ones who we think should be able to tell this story in this form. All right. We have some fabulous examples of artwork here from Chris. Can you tell us a little bit more? You were using these for your pitches for some of them at least. Yeah. So the, the one on the left is the one that actually sold. Um, 
which I look at now, like I look at this pitch because I didn't have any experience building proper pitch decks to pitch for TV. And so I look at it now and I go, oh, it's, it's pretty raw. But so what I did for this was I hired an artist who, it was basically a TV show set within the world of comics, um, basically detailing the lives of the creators behind the comic books themselves. And so I just, I hired an artist, paid him a couple hundred dollars, and he did this piece that was kind of a, just a tone setting cover image basically um, that then led into the deck where then I used photographs of the actual industry. I used photographs of actors who I saw were sort of of a similar type to the lead characters that I wanted. Um, and similar with this other docu this other piece too, it was just a kind of mood setter just to show that this other piece, this Horizon pitch was a science fiction show um, just to kind of give an immediate visual read on on basically what we're going for. And, you know, there's different ways to go about it. You don't necessarily have to hire somebody. Um, but I like to do that because I, I kind of come from a world where I, you know, work with people who do stuff by hand. Like, I, so I like to employ comic book artists whenever I can. And so for these, I hired a couple of comic book artists to do these pieces. But it were basically just to give a visual flavor before I got into the, the sort of words and nitty gritty of the pitch itself. Yeah, and can I just say it's... <laughs> You know, and it's tough. Like doing a good pitch deck takes, you know, people think I just whip it up or have an AI do it now. You know, it's like you can't like it takes just if you're going to do a really good pitch deck and you should, it's going to take a while. It's going to take it's like it's going to take, you know, a few weeks. You know, you're going to want to really think it through. You're going to want to figure out the wording. You want to find the right images. You're going to I mean, if you can, you know, have your best friend who happens to be a graphic designer do it. Great. If you can hire someone, great. If you can find the templates, great. You know, it does. It does make a big difference because you're putting yourself forward, you know, and this is what's representing you. And you want like consistency when the fonts and the look, and you also want to make sure that the deck fits, you know, as we've been talking about before, like what is that tone? You know, if all of a sudden, you know, you're dealing with a, you know, kind of like a dark drama and, you know, your pitch deck is in bright yellow and pink, you know, you're like, you know, it's not fitting the overall tone of what you're trying to get across, right? And so you're kind of looking at this, literally you're pitching yourself you're pitching this project and it it, it takes time you know it is and I, I know it's it's hard it's hard i struggle with it every single day and I, I literally i feel like i feel like every day i just put together pitch decks right and revising them and you're and you are revising it and you have a template version of a pitch deck and then you're you're tweaking it depending on who you're pitching to right you know and you kind of you're like okay tomorrow i have this meeting with this company you know netflix for example you know and so you're like we know what they want this you're going to you know cater it to them and change it then if you're going to another your co-production company you're going to go with a little different you know so realize it's always like a work in progress it's never like you have it done and then it's it sits there i like to do as much as i can myself i like to i like to really get my hands into it but after a while, it looks like I did it myself. And, you know, it suddenly becomes less professional. So at what point, you know, do we really need to be hiring a professional to do it? Where do I find these comic book artists or, you know, somebody who's not necessarily in my network? Are there like, you know, certain bars to go to or where, you know? <laughs> <laughs> where where am I meeting these people? The Hollywood canteen, right? We're all. Like, <laughs> uh, but that's always a big thing, is you know, people go, "Yeah, man, I'm happy to hire a professional, but where are they? How do I find them? What what's my strategy on that, you guys? What what have been your successful moments there? I, I mean, I know a fair amount of people that do those, so it's probably not. not I know that's not the same for everybody, but I see a lot of people that find on LinkedIn on on. You know, across any form of social media, you just ask a question. Somebody's going to know somebody and recommend somebody. Um, I don't know that there's a site to go to for that. I mean, other than like a Fiverr or something. But I think just asking, asking within your network, somebody's going to know somebody who's good at that. But I also think you don't need to be so professionally polished and refined that it looks like you hired a whole service to do this thing. Um, the idea is just to kind of give a flavor of what, like your words are the important thing. The pitch is the important thing. This is largely a leave behind, so I don't know. I, I think sometimes there's a little too much stock put in making it so perfectly professional that, that you sort of bog down on that instead of honing the pitch itself. I love that. I love that. Thank you for reassuring all of us here. The other thing, one other note I would add to that is brevity is also really important here. Um, if you're going to use a pitch document alongside your pitch, 
don't read the words off the screen and don't try to put the entire thing that you're saying onto different slides. A sentence or two per slide is great. Um, Cause then again, it's just to kind of give a flavor. It's not to give every bit of every part of the pitch. And also like, so I pitched this show during COVID. So it was all virtual and the slide deck, it was like 50 pages. And so I was trying to run it with this hand from this laptop while looking into the camera here and pitching it properly. And also had a lap or a, an iPad here with like my script on it. And I made myself crazy trying to keep up with all these things and not drop any part of it. And so just use it as a way to kind of enhance what you're saying, but don't be so reliant on it. I think your words and your energy and your enthusiasm for your idea are far more important than a couple of visuals on the screen. Having said that, let's go to the next one because we have that wonderful one pager that you have as well. Yeah, and so what this is, this is kind of when we're talking about like not just sending a screenplay or in my case, not wanting to just send a graphic novel. Um, with just about every graphic novel that I've done, I've created these basically these one sheets. So it'll start out. These are great. Mm -hmm. These are really beautiful. Yeah. Well, well, the nice thing is that there's the comic book art to pull from, which makes the visual part of it easy. But, you know, when Michael's talking about sort of starting slowly and giving just a little bit of the building on that, um, I'll start by, you know, having just a log line or a very brief descriptor. And if they go, yeah, that sounds interesting. Tell me a bit more about it. Then I can lead to this document, which kind of summarizes the whole story. I even created a little legend up in the corner that positions it as far as the genre and the audience goes. Um, and then from there, assuming that this reaches a point where they're actually interested, then I can send the full graphic novel or the full pitch. But it, again, it's basically trying to just build a little bit more each time and hopefully get them to keep asking questions. What happens next or tell me more each time and then uh, you know, onward from there. I've got a ton of these. I'm happy to share them. So I'm happy to uh, give my email to anybody after the fact if, if you know, seeing examples like this is any help to you. Fantastic. And we have a bunch of wonderful resources we'll see at the end with all of these things as well. Okay, so our pitch elements. Uh, oh, well, we really talked about that. Uh, when to hire the professional. What about AI? Do we love AI right now? What's what's the scoop? Everybody's glaring at me. I have, I have, I have a song, wait a minute, but I was like, I'll, I'll be quiet on this one. <laughs> Michael's glaring at me. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you'd probably have to bleep me if I gave my full opinion on, on, on AI for this purpose. Like, I get that AI has its practical applications. Again, I come from a, a sort of handmade medium, and so the idea of using AI to, to get visuals that don't necessarily perfectly convey what you want and supplanting an artist is very problematic to me. At the same time, I've also used images that I found through Google or through stock photography. And I, I don't necessarily see a broad distinction between the two for something like this. Like if you weren't going to hire somebody to, to create visuals for your deck and they just kind of help enhance the flavor, I don't know, like it's hard to give a nuanced answer and something that is so polarizing, but I don't, if it's not putting somebody out of work or taking money out of somebody's pocket, like I wouldn't use AI for those cover images that I showed you, but I certainly understand how people don't have access or the means to find somebody to do that, why they might gravitate toward that. But I think the thing to, to sort of be careful of is you don't know who you're pitching to. And there are people who are going to react really adversely to images that have eight fingers or three legs or, or you know, images that are very obviously AI created. Um, and so you kind of have to weigh the the immediate good or speed of being able to create something like that versus the potential adverse effect uh, that it might have on the person you're pitching to. Xavier, have you been seeing a lot of that coming into Netflix? Not really. I mean, just to think about it overall, I think in my mind, the AI conversation, it kind of gets into, I use the music industry as an example. Um, when you sit down with those development executives and you have this amazing pitch deck or this one pager, being able to distinguish what did you create versus what something or someone else created. And if you use something else, citing the source to that, because that is a conversation that I think development executives are going to have to have going forward, where it's like, use this song and it's like, oh, that's a sample. That's a sample from a Motown song that I heard. You have to give credit to that in music. Unfortunately, all of the laws and policies haven't caught up to that. 
So I do think that that's going to be a point of interest. And I don't know if anyone wants to go down the AI road when you're trying to get your idea pitched. Yeah. <laughs> as creative as it might be. It, it's a lot better to show an image from a Wes Anderson movie and say, I want this color aesthetic for my film. But if you use the Wes Anderson Star Wars image that was created by AI, that's really problematic. And so, yeah, I think to your point, using the actual source material instead of something that was pulled from that source material and filtered through AI is, is just going to create unnecessary problems. And there you have it. All right, AI closed. Let's. <laughs> well, all right, everybody's all like on their phone deleting stuff right now. <laughs> oh. Okay, uh, what are the nuances of pitching IPs, reboots, and original content? Uh, you know, how are they the same, different, and how can you make your original project just as appealing, if not even more appealing, please? Uh, I, I think on the idea of, of making IP, your own IP sound as appealing as existing IP, um, we kind of touched on a little bit, which is just finding the similarities but also build, playing up the differences. Like, it's like Barbie meets Oppenheimer, but it's different in this way. And so it's, you sort of set in their minds, like you're, you're basing it on these obviously very successful things, but it's different, it's different enough. Like it's unique enough, but it's not so wholly unique that they can't get any real sense of what you're saying or how it might work or what it might compare to. Um, and yeah, I don't know, as far as reboots and uh, remakes go, yeah, I would say actually really, again, study the industry, study the thing, right? So if you ask even development execs, what was Barbie really about? Was it really that, oh, we can we can go get any toy and make a, a hit movie out of it? Or was it about something deeper than that? I would correlate what it is that you're trying to create to those things and bring that to the conversation. Right. Was Barbie really about the story, the story arc and the time in which it came out in our Hollywood history? Or was it really just about the attachment to the Barbie doll, Mattel and that whole thing? So I would I would dive deeper when it comes to reboots and existing huge IP about what like what is the thing that caused us to love Frankenstein or, you know, some <laughs> random a piece of IP that we all grew up on. What is that thing? And then maybe in a perfect world, your new thing <laughs> can correlate to that as well. Or you can showcase if I did a refresh on Frankenstein, this is what that would look like in a 2024 world going forward. But also here goes, here goes my spec on the actual Frankenstein story. You know? I was trying so hard not to bring up Barbara earlier because <laughs> because the lessons learned from that film were so just misguided. Like, to your point, Barbie should be inspiring the studios to make other films with people like Greta Gerwig with similar messaging, but instead they want to make a fucking Hot Wheels movie. It's like, right. how do we how do we learn the wrong lesson from something that was so obvious to all of us? And so you kind of have to also know that you'll be pitching your thing that maybe was inspired for the right reasons because of Barbie's success to people that go, well, well Hot Wheels. <laughs> That's an excellent point. You, you always think people have the same mindset when you're walking mm -hmm. in and that you're already in agreement on something only to get Hot Wheels. <laughs> uh, on, on, oh, sorry. I was just going to, uh, I was going to jump over to like reboots and, and things like that. Um, the thing that I think with reboots that, that, are important when you're trying to suggest a, a reason for a reboot or a property in ripe, ripe for a reboot is not picking something that was so successful and perfectly done the first time just because it was a well-known or popular movie. Like, don't go in and pitch a remake of Taxi Driver, but find a thing that was, <laughs> like, I think Westworld was a successful example of a good reboot because the movie wasn't very good. But it was very unique and smart, and there was something behind it that, especially in today's world, felt like it was relevant for our current society. Um, and so finding a thing that maybe was done poorly, but the, the overall idea of it was good. Like, I think Logan's Run, not a great movie, but it's something that sort of the idea of youth culture and all of that um, feels like a thing that could be relevant in today's world. Like, something like, somebody go pitch a good reboot of Logan's Run. I think 
there's something there instead of pitching a reboot of something that was kind of done right the first time. I think that's going to be a much harder sell. Yeah, the only ones that could do that is I was talking about that today is like um, West Side Story. Like that was a perfect film. Only one person could really try to do that again. Steven Spielberg, right? Like, you know, for you to try it, it would be tougher, right? <laughs> and I think, you know, it was interesting. I was having coffee about like talking about like IP. So if you do have an, you know, an idea, a script idea that's based upon a memoir, right, or a book that people don't know, at least be upfront about it, like, because sometimes it's not very clear when I see certain pitches where they're saying, this is about, you know, they're like, it sounds like it's a new idea, but they're actually basing it upon, you know, this memoir, this article, this book, you know, and just be upfront about it immediately, and then to point what we are saying here before is, but then that's where you can say it's going to be different, better, you know, than this, you know, and then you can, the people can move on, you know, because the worst thing you want to do is kind of, it's not like you're hiding it, you just didn't bring it up. But if, if someone else finds out about it later, they're like, well, wait, you didn't mention that this is actually, you know, based on the IP and how we're, how we're defining it here, you know, from something else. Just and But the other thing, too, is if you do have IP that has a lot of materials that people are not aware of, you know, that's a nice thing about to put in your decks and to talk about because there might be stuff on YouTube that talks about it or there might be articles or there might be quotes that you can use that kind of help, you know, form a, uh, formula, um, create a formula around the narrative that you're trying to create, right? You know, and so it really depends on how much how much it is there. Sometimes you're like, I don't, you know, it's based upon this memoir, but it's really like inspired by or what's, what's the nuance in the industry? It's uh, inspired versus it's based upon and inspired by. There's like that. There's a nuance. If you ever notice, like in the movie, it says like inspired by means you have a lot more creativity, you know, on it. Whereas it's based upon, it tends to be a little bit more factual, right? You know, um, and so if it's really just inspired by, that's perfect, right? You know, but they just want to know that. Okay, original content in an IP and reboot world. Uh, okay, so basically, then why do I want to keep creating original content? Please do, please do. <laughs> <laughs> Michael says we need to create original content. Okay, put that in the pitch. I mean, yeah, I think we're all, we, we've all had enough of, of the endless remakes and reboots, right? Like we would all love to see more original stories out in the world. The key is, like we keep talking about, is finding the way to sort of stealthily get those ideas made in a world where it's much easier to develop something that has some form of a pre-sold audience, whether it's you know, a toy based property or books or what have you. Um, it's just trying to figure out the way to sort of tell your story and make it appeal to people who, who are, it's much easier for them and much less risky for them to greenlight something that already has a bit of a track record. Yeah, I think Chris hit it nail on the head where Gen Xers, millennials, we love our nostalgia, <laughs> right? We had the perfect childhood last key kids so for, for the businesses they just look at it as low risk right if we put out a movie about hot wheels eh, either it's great or it's not either way we can sell some toys we're going to hit x hundreds of millions of dollars we're going to recoup what we put into it it's more of a risk and this sounds so weird to say but it's more of a risk to fund that indie project right that that rom-com when rom-coms aren't going to theaters like that right now right um, and so that's why it's Reboot City, Reboot World, they're chasing brands. I think a good middle ground for those people that love reading, um, there was actually an article that came out about a week ago, and we'll make sure we can get that to you, about Reese Witherspoon and like what her company has done, which is basically like go after these authors, right? So technically it's existing IP, but it's original content. Little fires everywhere huge hit for Hulu, um, but going after just great stories. That's existing IP from amazing authors, but bringing it to the world to see in a different medium. And also really dissecting books that you love or, or films that you love and figure out what were the things in those books. Like if I don't want to pitch a reboot, what are the things in these books that I love that I can kind of adapt to my own or, or original idea? Um, like Stranger Things, I think, is a great example of that, where it was so clearly inspired by Stephen King novels and Stephen King movies, but they still found a way to sort of take all of that. And I mean, they weren't, like, to your point, not hiding their influences whatsoever, but still finding a way to tell a unique story with, you know, unique characters that still felt very familiar and very sort of safe for the people that are then backing these projects. 
that leads into our next question, which is then, why does the uh, creator need to do the majority of the heavy lifting as far as attaching talent or attaching a director or a showrunner, uh, coming with as complete a package as possible? Yeah, I mean, part part. I mean, part of the reason is is because we, if you're dealing with something original, you know, you're you're trying to like, you're trying to get as many people on your team. You're almost like packaging it. So the more people that you have that people know of, that are excited about the idea, it gives it more credibility, right? You know, because you're already struggling enough to get this, you know, this original idea out there. You know, but if you're able to say, oh, you have this A lister, whether it's a director or even a B lister, you know, like an actor or somebody that's already behind it, or even some financing, it kind of already shows that there's others behind it. You know, and so you, you know, as a creator, you're gonna have you're gonna have to do that. You know, and also, also I want to say too is, you know, what as original content like. You know, hopefully you love, you love this content, right? Because you're going to have to make other people love, you know, that content, right? You know, to get them excited by it. If you're kind of like, oh, I like it, you know, and if it's original, it's going to be a harder sell, you know? But if there's something that you truly, truly are passionate about, you have to kind of showcase that. And I think that's, that's the reason why it kind of goes back on, unfortunately, you know, because, you know, the studios, other co-production companies, you know, when it comes to original content, you're just you're trying to get them passionate about it and then they'll get more passionate about it because it's a business they'll get passionate about it because you are and oh by the way you've said someone else attached to it you know because it, it removes the risk and it's kind of going back to where we went with the comp titles you know you're like oh i know it is kind of like that and those those made money ergo okay i can see where this fits into this overall genre that said <laughs> <laughs> the packaging thing it kills me we've had so many different projects where there was a big director attached or there's a big star attached there was both attached and then you pitch it to this studio who goes well, i don't like that director or i want this actor involved but this actor had a bad experience with that director or do you solve that you don't attach them you say they are interested and available yeah it's just so they're yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they're not at the so you're like which means you can change them out <laughs> you know i know i know, I know, I know, it, say know it. it feels like there's like you're whatever you're offered up gives them the reason to say no um or this agency reps this guy but not this person and so we can't work with those two together and so this or this director's, I don't know, the packaging thing, like if you don't have attachments, it's not enough. If you have attachments, it's sometimes too much or it's the wrong attachment or, and there's never a formula or there's never an answer on what the attachment should be, but it's like, nah, it doesn't work. What else you got? I'm like, we try again. So, so yeah, yes, it's, you're no, right. Yeah. No, and but, I think also to your point, yeah, it's, it's tough because you start off every, almost like every single pitch deck, you see the people that people want. It will never ever be those people. Like it's rare, you know. It's it's super rare. It's funny you brought up the Stranger Things because someone shared me the original pitch deck for that, and you see what it was. It was taking place in like Long Island, I want to say, or something like that. And it was like you could see the feel and tone, you know. But it was like when you see what's what was actually present, you know, what's actually on TV was was different. It still had that element, but that pitch deck was very different, yeah. you know, than what it, I mean, not very different. I mean, it was there. You saw all the elements of it, but you have to realize. When you're going into like these pitches or even attaching talent, like you have to be, you have to be willing and able to be very flexible to let this, you know, your project kind of evolve to where it eventually will be. Because what you're starting off with and where it ends, it's going to be a different thing. But it's up to you to know what you're willing to bend on, right? If someone wants to change the entire character arc and you're like no you know you're not going to do it or you know or change the gender or change whatever it might be i think you jen you yeah. you had that right like, i'm chuckling over here in the corner yeah yeah you know and, yeah and so it was like <laughs> jen has to kind of be like no that's where it is like I'm, people are willing to bend you know on certain things but then only you will really know because you're going to get a lot of feedback saying change 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 and you can see some people are like okay i'll just change it and then it becomes mush you know but then at the same time you have to kind of know i'm willing to change this but here's you know, here's where this entire, the, the core of this entire reason why I'm doing this is there and I'm not going to change that, you know, but that's, you only, only you as the creator will know that, you know, and you have to make those tough decisions to figure out like what you're willing to compromise on. Michael, I love you. You just like jumped into our next slide, which is how much creative freedom do we actually get to maintain while we're navigating all of this? 
you were saying, how much freedom do you actually get to maintain as a creative and how much give and take are you actually planning to you know, have to give up, basically? I, I think ultimately <laughs> it boils, it still boils down to a lot of risk, right? Um, did you, as a, as a new creative to this town, did you come in with an existing production company that's going to help you run this thing? It's the difference between even having like a script and, hey, this is great. We love it. You love it. Let's do it. But actually saying do it and here goes the money to do it. That's a whole nother ball game of, hey, what is this actual risk? So a lot of new creatives, they tag, what I've seen as of late is they tag team or they partner with some existing production company that usually already has a relationship with the studio or the network that you're pitching to and that mitigates the risk. And hopefully as a creative, you have a relationship with the production company so to, to actually keep your guardrails up on what you want your project to be as a first timer. Once you've done this show a couple of times, then it's kind of, hey, whatever Chris wants to do. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, at the start, it, it's kind of how much control do you want to pretend you have <laughs> or, or how badly do you want to get something made? Because there's always going to be things you don't agree with. Like I've had casting put in front of me that I look at and I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Um, but you smile and go, yeah, I can see how that is working. <laughs> and you go home and punch the wall. But I mean, you, you, you sort of, you smile and nod and go along with it to whatever degree you can while kind of trying to steer this direction, but not pushing back so firmly that you seem intractable or, or like you're going to be trouble. Um, but, but the level of control you have also depends on your title. Like if you're only the writer or you're the writer and you're a co-EP versus being an EP, like you get certain levels of control at each of those different levels. Um, but ultimately it kind of comes down to how flexible are you going to be to allow this thing that you came up with to get made? You know, I, I had sold a property years ago, this graphic novel project of mine called Zombies vs. Robots to a studio. They immediately changed the name to Inherit the Earth, which we thought was kind of stupid because our title, this is before sort of all the Versus movies came and went. Um, we thought the title was kind of the nice marketing descriptor of what the film was about. Inherit the Earth didn't sound like, sound like a guy who got a plot of land from a dead uncle um, but we go okay yeah that's great i can see how that could work it doesn't have anything to do with zombies or robots um but fine and they attached directors who came in and made it something totally that was far away from the source material changed the story in ways that we never would have done but ultimately it wasn't a personal story it wasn't a thing that was autobiographical that i really cared enough about to fight back i really just kind of wanted to see it get made in that form and so I sort of relinquished the control, knowing that if I'm cashing their check, you're sort of doing that by relinquishing that control. So you also have to make that trade off. Like, you know, you can't really have it both ways. Um, if they're paying you to take this thing and make it into what they need it to be, you sort of have to let that go or else you don't really have any business taking their money. And so, again, it's kind of just figuring out what, what part of the process you can give up and still live with yourself and still live with what you want this property to be. With lots of holes in the walls. <laughs> <laughs> Which then you can hire a professional to fix your walls. <laughs> Keeping the economy moving. Okay, everybody, pop quiz time. Execs, who does what and when? So we've got our development execs, our production, uh, excuse me, producers, studio producers and executive producers, finance execs. And, you know, how, how are they all interweaving with each other? Walk us through this. So, <laughs> I'll basically start with, there's the studio side, which is going to help you get your project out there. They're going to do the distribution more than likely and get it out to the world. And then there's the production side of things, right? On the production side, that's the day-to-day. -day. You're talking about your director, your writer, your, <laughs> your executive producer, your line producer, all of those people that are helping actually lift the project right so i look at it as like the director's kind of like the ceo on set um your line producer is like your coo um and on the studio side 
you have all of those positions where our goal is to help have conversations with everyone that's actually on the set in the studio, uh, actually on the set in the production world to bring that to life. So I work all the time with the line producer, the unit production manager to say, hey, this is what we're spending on because we're, we're shooting page three today. Page three is supposed to take this long. It's actually gonna, this is, this is actually how long it took. We came in short, what can we do with that extra money? Hey, you all can do this on page five instead. <laughs> so now we can make page five a bigger scene. There's a constant tug and pull of how we literally go, go through every single page of the script. I like how in your example, they finished early, so we had extra money. That, that was a good example. <laughs> rub the Buddha, rub the Buddha. I would say even on the executive producer side, there are some differences. Um, like with Lock and Key on the Netflix series, I was a non-writing EP, and what that meant was I didn't get any control over the scripts, but I, I could give notes. You know, I was I was involved in the process of when the writers and the showrunner pitched us on what the season would be, what the arcs would be. You know, giving notes on that, they, which they don't have to necessarily take, but I, you at least are part of that process. The same with on the script side, I would read through the scripts and I would give notes if I thought they were additive or if there was something that sort of, I don't know, didn't adhere to the rules, didn't follow whatever form of consistency we were trying to go for in the show. Um, but you ultimately don't have much more power to affect change beyond suggesting notes, sort of in the way that a development exec will will give notes, but but their notes are usually heated to a greater degree. But then I'm also an EP on the show that I created, and I have a much greater degree of control on that because it's a show that I, you know, brought to them and sold on my own. And so, you know, again, like there are just different levels of sort of authority and, and control at all of these different types. Is that in your contract? Is that like the difference between like you have the approval rights versus consultation? Yeah. Is that, okay, yeah. And if it's not spelled out up front, it doesn't happen. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, every now and then I see like they, they have consultation and then it kind of is implied it's approval or is that, yeah, or no? I mean, it, it's, it's approval some... in that sometimes you get the pat on the head like, look, you know, anyway, we're going to go make our show. Uh. Now, Xavier, to follow up, you were saying that you work a lot with the development execs. Um, and can you just clarify, because you always think of them as separate departments, you know, well, we pitched it to the development people and we got it to them and now financing is going to come in and now, you know, then it's, then marketing comes back in after it's all done. Yes. Yeah, so Michael. <laughs> to kind of take you all behind the, the wall, um, look at it like this. Let's say you all have an idea that we're, we're going to make it right. We're going to make this a film. So. As a production company, you work with the studio to actually get this thing done. What we present to you as soon as you leave that pitch meeting, our creative, our development exec, that's like our CEO on that specific movie television show. They're there to guide the process of everything that's gonna happen. Their cap is more creative, but with that, then we have legal. That gets all the contracts. No one can start working until legal goes through legal and labor kind of together, make sure everybody's union, non-union, IATSE, whatever, right? Um, and then there's finance. You gotta spend the money. So finance comes in, we're, we're there with the development exec, with legal, we're ready to start working, there's no bank account. <laughs> Literally, it's like setting up a business. So every single movie, television show, cartoon, comic, it's literally setting up a business and so development exec, creative cap, legal, making sure all of the paperwork, making sure that this now intellectual property is protected, right? Finance, how are we spending money? How are we saving money? How are we overspending money? And then the last piece is physical production. And physical production is page one. How are we shooting this? Where are we shooting this? Is there a stage at Warner Brothers? Are we shooting this at Sony? Are we shooting in Georgia? Are we shooting in LA? Those are like the four, I call them the four corners of how to actually lift your project. And under that physical production piece, that's where you also get that you also get music, post-production, visual effects. Those those four corners help you actually lift the project.
project. See, to that, um, knowing that going in, the, the show that uh, that hopefully gets going at Paramount, the pilot script, there's a scene, and it's kind of a key scene that involves an outdoor rally at um, Golden Gate Park. Mm -hmm. But if it needs to move into an Elks Lodge because, you know, you can't shoot outdoors, you can't do the crowd, we need to bring it and make it smaller, that's not going to affect the scene in an adverse way. Like, so not being so tied to a specific location or setting, um, but, but sort of being adaptable to what that scene needs to be depending on the budget. Because I don't know what the budget might be if this thing ever comes to pass. And so if it can't be outdoors, it needs to move inside. It certainly can. So yeah, just I guess to your point about not knowing the numbers, don't be so so stuck on it has to be this because chances are something of what you intend or the setting you intend is probably going to change. Yeah, I think that's the flexibility that you both talked about, like mm -hmm. knowing the heart of your story, knowing what the overall goal is, and so that as those things I just mentioned a lot of people as those four corners, but keeping your story, the integrity of your story. Um, exactly what you want it to be I think it's, it's your that's your hat that's what you are captain of um, because some things may make it better some things yeah. maybe not so much I, a lot of times I watch content that's made and I'm like wow the script was so great though because yeah. <laughs> so much changes like I'm sure that read really well like I'll go to the movie theaters watch a movie and I'm like I'm sure that read like really well but something happens in the physical production of lifting that story. And so be involved, learn, there's so much to learn. We haven't even talked about tax incentives. I'm not gonna nerd out on that, but <laughs> just just even having the idea of um, why you can shoot in New York, why you should shoot in New Jersey, why you should shoot in Canada or Georgia and being able to be flexible on those parts of your story. Um, I think it shows a mastery of your craft and of what's going on in this industry. What role do tax incentives play in your pitch? Okay, so you don't need to know a lot about this. General rule of thumb. You know, we talked earlier about um, what it is that you actually present to studios or networks when you go into these pitch meetings. Just being able to have a conversation to say, hey, on page three <laughs> of this script, we actually thought about, you know, I think we don't need to do this winter scene in New York. You know, I think we can settle on just being in, you know, like Georgia or what a winter scene could be like in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, <laughs> because each each state, each territory, they have tax incentives. So as you all write, don't limit your writing, but as you write, these are just things to, to keep in mind, right? Um, tax incentives are huge. I'm sure you watch a lot of content. You see that Georgia peach come on at the end. I'm going to give you just a quick overview. So most states, not Georgia, they just give a refundable tax incentive, which means they say, hey, if you come shoot in our state and you hit these criteria for every budget line, like hair and makeup, all your below the line costs, all your above the line costs, you actually do your editorial here, post-production, your VFX, we'll give you 20% of your budget back. Studios look at that like, ooh, we get to save money, which is true. And everybody's a happier camper. But in Georgia, what's different about that market is they don't have a cap. So in California, they say, hey, we have $500 million <laughs> to give out to films every two years. So everyone applies to be a part of that 500 million, right? Just make it, totally make it in right? Um, in Georgia, they don't have a cap. So the reason why you see a lot of productions happening in Georgia is because they say, hey, bring your business here. You want to film? Come here. Now, the difference is, you know how we all pay taxes, right? In most states, most of these United States, um, that's how film tax credits work as well. We finish the production, we, we, we basically do a tax return, we apply for it, hopefully we get everything that we're projecting, you get a nice little bonus because you came in where you're supposed to come in at and the production's happy. In Georgia, that's not the case. In Georgia, they do what's called a transferable tax credit, which is that it trades on a market. 
because they have corporations like Coca-Cola and Home Depot who are looking to offset their tax burdens. So they say, hey, Chris, that production you have, 30% of your budget's like $15 million. Coca-Cola is interested in that $15 million. They'll pay you X amount for it. Are you open to trading? Every character will be drinking a Coke. <laughs> <laughs> and that's your flexibility, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. I, now I've given you a lot. You don't need to know all of that. But just having a general like idea that tax incentive is a huge part of your story writing, of where this thing will take place. Those are the conversations that will happen outside of you or with you. Um, but it's it it's it's a huge part of the business now. Yeah, it's funny because I'm working on a project where we did we applied for tax incentives in Puerto Rico, and it was a lot more complicated and took too long. So now it's in Northern Ontario. So it's just you know it's just more granted more indoor scenes, you know? <laughs> less, less you know winter wonderland or tropical, right? You know. <laughs> But, you know, it's the money money talks. And, okay, so speaking of money, what is a back-of-napkin budget? Okay, so once you all get that great great news that, hey, we want to we work with you, mm -hmm. we want this script, the studio or the network will do what we call it back, is a back-of-napkin budget. Basically, it's just a very high-level uh, comps. We think this, this, that this script will cost this much. It's kind of like Wednesday. It's going to be this much. They go by category. And we get like three A-listers. We think above the line will be this much. We think we'll film this in Oregon because we'll get a good tax credit. It's very high level before you actually later on in the development process do a deeper dive. Um, so if you ever hit a turn back in napkins, just act like you know something. Yeah. It's, just, it's a very high level budget that's just basically built off of college. Do, do um, with a question following up on that is do, um, people who pitch you, do they ever have that? Because very often we talk about pitch decks, right? You know, it's like in the script and so on. Does anyone ever come in with this back of napkin budget, you know, with included with the entire project? Do they have to have them? No, no one ever really comes in with that because the studio's got its reasonings for even positioning and like, you may say, hey, this is a, this is a $2 million an episode TV show. And you're like, eh. I mean, you, don't, you, don't, you just never know what the studio is thinking, so you don't need to come in with that. But I think just having general knowledge of what it is, again, shows a mastery of you know, lower risk of, oh, this, this person's been around this industry. They know some things. Because these are kind of the buzzwords that they won't tell you. But, like, if you're able to say these things, like, hey, this is great. You want my script? When are we doing it back in napkin? Oh. <laughs> oh, no, it's interesting to say that because it's funny, not for this, it's funny, I didn't know if they did that at the studios because we've had to do a back of napkin budget where it was a little bit more formal. It was like a few spreadsheets, you know, type of thing. But it, it wasn't, it was interesting. It wasn't, it wasn't pitched to a studio. It was pitched to investors, right, outside the studio system that wanted to kind of roughly have that idea. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's not easy. Those those budget line items, it's 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 a skill. It's like a, it's like an, it's a skill set, you know, that people have. They're able to do it. Um, but yeah, okay. So it's good to know it's not just the, it's not the studios. Okay, and all of my friends out here in the audience, wait for the resources page. You're gonna be smiling. You're gonna be smiling. Speaking of all these budget items and stuff. Okay, last question on this slide. So who helps in the actual process of taking the script page and actually getting it physically filmed and budgeted? So that is physical production or production management that sits in every studio, every network. It is their job to work with you all as creatives. And they literally, I think they use movie magic uh, uh, breakdown, but they break down your script. And so because they do that process, when development execs are actually reading your scripts, they're thinking in mind <laughs> with some of the things that physical production actually has to do. So if you come in there and you're like, this kid has a Captain America t-shirt on and they're gonna go past Walmart, down Hollywood Boulevard, um, to the Tesla uh, car show, literally they're just seeing dollar signs of everything that you're saying. So physical production is like, how can we practically film that for whatever approved budget, it, whatever the approved budget is for the movie. Um, and that's where the flexibility <laughs> comes in on your part where it's like 
Do we have to do this on Hollywood Boulevard? Can we can we afford to shut down Hollywood Boulevard? Can we get Target to sign off on even like driving by Target? Can we get Tesla in or not? Will Disney approve a Captain America T-shirt and a non-Disney? Like those things start to come up. Same with uh, suggesting music. Yeah. Unless you really, really, really have to have this particular song, it should always be a song like this, and not not firmly just say it has to be that song because chances are that song's probably going to be pretty expensive. Yeah, music. I've seen music stop films. Sometimes people are like, "Why does it take so long for this TV show to come yeah. back or for this?" Sometimes it's the music, it's just the clearances. There are artists that are no longer with us going through legal, going through their estate, even for a 30 second clip. Then we have musicians that we all love. I'll give an example, the Rolling Stones, right. where they're like, hey, for 30 seconds, that's yeah. like 500K. <laughs> Can we get a discount? <laughs> but music, like say what you want, because um, it's funny watching like, the, like the, the initial cut of different films. People are like, oh, Katy Perry, Jay-Z, Miley Cyrus, oh, we can, we can only afford like one of those. <laughs> um, but then you find the music that gives you the feeling of that song. Especially if you want the worldwide rights on the music, <laughs> you're gonna pay a fortune. <laughs> look at this, look at this. Yeah, check it out, you guys. Please take pictures of this immediately. Immediately. Our resources here are awesome. Obviously, the first one there is Syzygy Publishing. <laughs> Yeah, and then let me see. Oh, yeah, and then Michael, you have a wonderful book you had up there, the International Film oh, Business. Yeah, a friend of mine, a friend of mine just told me about it this no. week, and she loved the International Film Business, and so I just threw it right in there because I actually got it. So it's actually really helpful. Okay, and then we have a, a few budgeting resources there, and uh, we actually have a couple of templates on there. So that's again, take pictures, and obviously, you know, it's going to be on the YouTube channel once I edit it. So you know. Um, oh, and I just wanted to add, because I know that this sounds like a lot. The industry, it's a lot of pieces. It's a lot of moving um, targets. <laughs> but these links are just to, to truly help you gain a certain knowledge or insight, not necessarily for you to do everything yourself, but you'll be surprised at the way that you have conversations once you have just some insight on music being so expensive. And, oh, you thought about that for your project or you know where you want to shoot for from a tax incentive purpose. Like those things can carry your pitch a long way. We, and can I wait just a little bit? That's why we put these panels together and network because you can't do this all alone, right? It is it is a lot of stuff and it might seem overwhelming, but that's what we're here to help each other out. The other thing is there's links to um, a screenwriter yes. named uh, Xavier, who is a writer for Lost and other shows. He puts up a ton of resources, like all these different pitch documents, um, Basically, every format of everything you might want to reference, but there's also a thousand, thousand other ways to do it. And so, unlike like a screenplay or a teleplay where there's very much a format you need to follow, there's not that for pitches. And so, you can also just Google. There's also a lot of other writers and people that have put up all kinds of other documents that are helpful. So, don't feel like anything you see at his link or even at any other link is the only way to do it. It's like, there's lots of ways to. Uh, to do this you don't have to feel like you have to match a format but chris what i love is that we have somewhere to start yeah you definitely. know and this is a guy who obviously knows what he's doing yeah. with all of these examples and oh hallelujah really i can i can download this and learn from this yes please so i i know that was you know a big question for me when i was first working on you know decks and bibles and blah 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 and you just go well i'll put something on the page jackson pollock is a huge inspiration just throw it <laughs> Somebody help me. So now you've got some people that the, this, this is what they really do. And it's fantastic information. We've also got uh, the California Film Commission on there. We've got articles on how to pitch your movie, things to include. And also with that for the comic book pitch as well. I'm just, I am so excited about all these. You guys, you're going to have so much fun. Everybody call in sick tomorrow to your jobs. You got, you got to do this. You got to do this instead. So thank you for coming. Who has questions? Who has a question? Joe? I have a question. What role, of, in, uh, if any, does an agent play? Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Ooh, what's the role of the agent, if any? <laughs> the silence says <laughs> <that. laughs> Well, it's been, you know, I mean, there's, uh, there's so many, you know, there's like... <laughs> 
there, there, <laughs> there's, I mean, there's so many different types of agents, right? You know, on that level, is it for you know dealing with the talent? You're dealing with um, screenwriters. You're dealing with directors. Um, they, in general, you, I, I've seen. I've enjoyed working with directly with the people I want to work with. You know, but as a you producer, can, you as a producer yes, yeah. I. That's yeah. the idea. But you can't. You can't always do that. You can't always do that, right? And and they're there to. You know, if you're going with the talent agencies, right, then, I mean, here's the good thing about people complain about them, but the good thing about it is, is that they, they're kind of almost like a one-stop shop. You know, they'll be able to talk to the brands, they'll be able to talk to uh, um, directors, and they'll be able to talk to the sports agents, you know, on the side that can help out with things if you want to do a sports, you know, type of film. Um, they, they're, they're really helpful there, you know, on that level. Um, I don't know. I mean, do you have to, is it coming from a space of, Oh, it's coming from when you go in the pitch. Sometimes you expect that you need to have representatives. Oh, you! So, oh, oh, I see. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, yeah. so if I can okay, say sorry, that again totally, on the totally microphone. Totally, totally missed that. Okay. Uh, so, how necessary is the agent for your own team when you're right. going into pitch? Right. I would say I have found, and I'll say I'm trying to say this delicately <laughs> enough, but oh, I have found some representation in the past most helpful at the end of the process, not necessarily for the pitch process. That's where, you know, if you have a manager or somebody helping you on that front to help set up meetings and get you into the room for the pitch, that's very helpful. I have found the agent not necessarily overly involved in that part as much as when there's an offer on the table, then they're great to bring in, help you get the best deal, help you figure out your way through the contracts and all the different points and language that you maybe don't understand, but but I haven't found it to be as essential for the upfront part of the process, if I, if I said that delicately enough. If, may I jump in on that? So, but you might need your, if it's not the agent that's helping you get in the room, it might be a manager or a, a mutual contact or somebody that can, that can shorten that conversation to get you in. Certainly, and I mean, to Michael's point, there is a vast array of agents who like to handle different parts of the process, um, but certainly you're never going to see an agent more engaged than when there's a deal to be closed. Um, I think, yeah, that's the best time to just bring them in. Like, I, you yeah. know, I don't like having an agent kind of you know, one creator I always wanted the agent on emails. I'm like, no, it's not going to happen. It just it just signals that there's no trust, right? Like in the sense that if you if you really are passionate about your project and you want to get out there and talk to people, you know, you do that. I mean, it, are there agents that will actually do it? I don't know if you know. Right, that's you know, if you're a bigger you know celebrity, you know, and in the business you can get away with that. But I think if you were there, like independently trying to go out there, do the leg work. Don't rely on the agent. The agent's great, as Chris is saying, is like when you, you need them in the room for for negotiating. I mean, that's their job, you know. And if they have great contacts, then yeah, definitely lean in on them, you know. And I've dealt with agents who, who are really good at dealing with specific parts of the industry. They're great at it, you know. But I don't think they're you know they're the ones that you have to go through all the time. So. And I'm just going to take a step back with the whole so agent, manager, lawyer, right? Um, all about low risk for these studios and the business. A lot of times they tell you that, hey, to set up a meeting with us, you have to have an agent, you have to have a manager, you have to have a lawyer. That's to mitigate their risk. I don't take unsolicited pitches. You'll hear that line a lot. That's because they don't want you to sue them for this idea that maybe they had a development for five years that's like your idea. And so that just helps filter, right? Aside from that, <laughs> there are loopholes. <laughs> One of those, this is not really a loophole, but for development execs, it's their job to bring in, to hunt, right? They have to bring in new IP, new ideas. They are the ones that are at film festivals. They're the ones that show up to WGA sponsored events or SAG events or DGA or PGA events because they need to be where new content is. So you'll hear the term a general meeting. General meetings, that's something that all the studios and networks do. You kind of have to find your way into a general meeting. You don't necessarily need representation to have a general meeting. It's just a, a meeting of interest. You have a script or some idea. We want to talk about it. We want to learn about it. Let's have the meeting. Um, so look for or when you go to these networking events and there's development executives there, 
use the term, hey, do you do any general meetings? Can I have a general? I'd just love to take a general with you, right? And here's my back of napkin. <laughs> <laughs> they, they log those meetings. They talk about, they, they, they literally take log of what you all talk about in case they ever need to come back to that idea or if they're interested in the idea. There are a lot of different ways around it because I know sometimes creatives, up and coming creatives get turned off because they're like, I don't have a manager. I don't have a lawyer. I don't have an agent. Like, how do I even get to that point? There are different ways. I love that term general meeting because it reminds me of like, you know, when people are on the job search, it's like you don't ask for a job, you do an informational interview, right? You know, it's a, but everyone knows. I mean, I'm sure the development execs, they all, you all know you're looking for a job. The development execs know you're trying to pitch, you know, but it's kind of like the terminology, you know, on it because it's easier to, if you ask for the job, they'll say no. If they ask for the pitch, they'll say no, but it, you know, it sounds like general meeting is a nice way to put it. Yeah. Much easier to say yes to that. Yes. Okay, somebody's getting a flooded inbox tomorrow, huh? A lot of LinkedIn going on there. <laughs> Who else has a question? In the second row, thank you. Hi, I'm Antoinette. I have, uh, my question goes back to comps. When you're talking about five years or what's great, well, in the life of Reboot, say that there's friends and there's Gilmore Girls and there's, um, oh my gosh, just, um, ah. anyways. What it, oh, it's one of my cops, which is really crazy. But anyway, Goonies, Goonies, Goonies. <laughs> yeah. okay, Goonies. <laughs> but no, the thing is, you have these shows that were amazing, and then they've been rebooted, and they're not so amazing. The characters aren't three dimensional, and you want to use the older one as a cop versus the new, revived. You know what? What? How does that work? I mean, I kind of think that, that if it's a show like Gilmore Girls that cast a real big shadow in its first run, but the reboot didn't leave too much of a mark, right. I'd say exactly. that most people are going to think of the original, unless you specifically call out, you know, the remake or the reboot, I thought was great. The original series, not so much. Um, I think most people are going to use the, the original, the source, as your point of reference, but I also think it's fair enough to, to call that out. Um, don't necessarily slam the remake, but you know, right, exactly. the first five seasons of Gilmore Girls or something along those lines. Yeah, and I think the key, to, the key thing to note about the comps again is you, you could use any type of comps to give the idea of like what you're trying to go after, right? I think when we were talking about comps, not going, uh, Jen was saying like not before COVID, that's really more of a, um, the a what, what people are looking for, but right. also if you're looking at like how well it does like from a budget like box office wise, or you know, it's like it's more on that side of using it more from a business perspective. It's different than hey, you know, it's like uh, for example, I'm using one comp where I go back to ET because of the story, you know, right. that was way back, right? You know, but but it, it, it evokes that feeling and tone of what right. it's about, and that's what and that if that's the goal, then that's perfect. Okay, okay. Like a reboot of ET. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. That answered my question. So thank you very much. Right behind you there. Pass the mic. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, I'm Naki. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, so my question goes back to when we were talking about, you know, maybe directors getting attached to a project and like taking it way in a way different direction than you originally planned or like just a bunch of cooks in the kitchen and it turns out as something totally different um, than it started. How do you find the balance between, I guess, or I guess actually a different way to say it would be, in your experiences, have you seen it to be beneficial for people to have a mindset of being, you know, doing different projects like that and just kind of building up their resume, even if they're not exactly something that they want their name on or they feel like is a right representation of their brand? Or, you know, how do you find the balance between that and like being really kind of more picky about what your name goes on <laughs> um, and, you know, how that represents you? No, that's a really good question. I have a, I have a real world example um, that I was going to bring up earlier and didn't because I didn't know if I wanted to film or not, but what the hell? Um, so when I got married, like I was, my wife was planning the wedding and, and I mean, we were both planning it. I wasn't like a non-participant, but, but she would come up with these ideas that I had never imagined that could be a thing. Like, what if we did ostrich feathers on every table? They cost this much. And I was like, oh my God, no. Um, and so I started saying no early on to these wild ideas. And I could see the like, kind of like gritting her teeth, like you're not even entertaining my great idea. 
And then a week later, there'd be another idea. And I'd be like, well, boy, what about the ostrich feathers? Like, oh, that was last week. And so I learned to not say no to these things because a lot of times the, the not great ideas went away. So by that same token, like I had, I had a show where they had a director and a star that were so, so, so wrong for this thing. Um, and I just kind of smiled and said, okay, let's see where this goes. Knowing that it was terrible, but also knowing that it was very likely that they would drop off and they did. And so I, I guess the, the short answer is to be flexible about it until if it got to a point where you feel like this is really going to be the thing that signs on, you should certainly voice like always voice that you just don't necessarily think something is exactly what you're going for, but you can see how it could work, you know, kind of that, that flexible, but not sort of reply. But I have found that being too, sort of firm about that's wrong for my property up front usually works itself out without you having to to sort of be that firm about it if that makes any sense yeah pick your battles that way yeah <laughs> <laughs> get the back thank you all for being here um sort of a harkens back to I think Chris mentioned something about how big you come in with development execs so that they have the opportunity to put their stamp on it give notes feel like they're part of the co-creative process this is a question specific to TVs and TV and streamers um, my experience in one case with streamer was going into pitch with an idea that they liked and done they said a friend there said you can either write the script or you can find a showrunner to come in and kind of de-risk it that they know can deliver the deliver the goods. But these streamers also have deals with showrunners. So my question is, when you're coming in, how big to come in if there are showrunners that already have deals at that buyer where they are you feel like they're right for the project, how auspiced up do you recommend trying to get before you're pitching an idea if you're uh, not a streamer approved showrunner, for instance? I mean, I find that, that a curious choice that they would give you because writing and show writing are such different things that I it feels to me like you could certainly write the script, write the pilot or write episodes for your idea, but you also have a showrunner to sort of oversee the whole process and manage budgets and, and schedules and all of those things. And so it's curious that, that it would be an either or scenario, whereas to me it feels like both of those things should be able to happen. So I, I don't know from your side if there's a different way of looking at that. Yeah, of course. You'll, you'll love this buzzword. <laughs> Risk. That's ultimately what they're guarding against, right? I think the I try to look at what, what's the win-win situation in that. I think one win is, hey, here goes an up-and-coming showrunner. I know he, has, he or she hasn't worked with your studio or your network, but this person really gets my project where I can focus on the creative and I know that things are gonna happen the way that I envision them to, right? But then also, research done. Here is a showrunner that is already in an overall deal at your streaming company or at your network. I think this person's work could lend itself to be helpful in what I'm trying to lift off the ground here. Maybe there's a world where they co-showrun, right? where I get to bring in who I want to have my back. You all mitigate risk by bringing in someone that's an overall deal, who's not working, who you need to be working because you're paying them. Um, and there's a world of collaboration where that can happen. I know that's like super optimistic, but I think even presenting them with those options of how to bring in your person versus bringing in someone, or I think even being able to go to them and say, Hey, we know that you have Ryan Murphy. He's busy. Do you think that this fits in his wheelhouse? Can we bring in someone to work with him? Because what is happening from an industry standpoint in TV, is there's a shortage of showrunners. And so it's like, how can we get a good showrunner? We have to train showrunners. We have to train people to be good showrunners. So the co the co word is a new term that's being used, and you'll see that on a lot of your favorite TV shows. I think you can get far with that. What's the term? Uh, Co-showrun. 
bring in your person and a person that they already have a deal with at the studio. Pass that behind you. Pass that microphone back. <coughs> We're hitting each row, everybody. I love all these questions. Uh, hi, guys. My name's Parker. Um, first of all, thanks to the four of you for being here. I'm sure we're all kind of thinking that, so really appreciate it. But I think my question is kind of echoing some of the other folks who have spoken a little bit earlier. Is just, you know, you've you've got your pitch deck, you've got your your maybe a script or a pilot or a couple scripts, and you've got all your materials and and this idea that you want to go in and pitch. And you've touched on, you know, being kind of new creatives or first timers and union, non-union. And I think for people just starting out, I'm curious. And, and you talked about setting your general meetings for Goonies Part Two and stuff like that. But I, I wonder, you know maybe just a few more pieces of advice for folks that are trying to kind of take that off the ground and move forward into, you know, their careers and, and what getting to that table looks like for someone who may not have an agent or be represented and, and kind of have all the tools at their disposal out of the gate, if that makes any sense. Something that I've seen post, if I can say post COVID, um, be successful um, for up and coming uh, creatives is, and this is going to sound cliche, but just walk with me down this path. Sure. Film festivals, right? And I'm not talking about just the, the big ones. I'm not talking about TIFF or Sundance or um, any of those. Actual localized film festivals where these studios and networks, they branch out, they sit. Most of the time, you don't even know that there, there's creatives in the audience or that's there judging these panels and things like that. But for some reason, it breaks down a barrier, a wall of them being in that environment to actually form relationships, to seek out content, to get fresh ideas and fresh perspectives where I've actually seen meetings generate into something, generate into deals, generate into content being made. Um, and from a press perspective, you only hear about it at the big film festivals where people have put up all this money and they've got this amazing project and they've had A-list talent attached or something like that. But I've also seen it on the other side of that. And there's so many film festivals. I would do my research, like if you're here in, in the state of California, hey, what are the ones where contents actually come out of uh, the Long Beach Film Festival or the Bay Area Film Festival? Or like, like what are those film festivals where people have been successful? Because maybe that's where... And it, you don't even need a finished product. Some of these film festivals, they take scripts and literally creative execs are reading through five pages <laughs> of a script and determining if they want to meet with those up and coming people. So it, it requires a little bit of research on your part, but I have seen the film festival circuit be successful. On that note, our previous panel was on film festivals, everybody. <laughs> so check out our YouTube channel, because we do have a lot of great information on that. And uh, also with lists of, you know, obviously the main A festivals and then the genre festivals and some of those, you know, locals, et cetera, et cetera. So that would certainly give you a jumping off point. We're good. Uh, do we have time for what? Do we have one more question? I don't know what our time is like. And that's a wrap, everybody. Do we have one more? Ooh, yay, in the corner. Final question. Well timed. Uh, hi, um, my name is Connor Rakes, uh, and thank you for putting this on this evening. Um, I wanted to ask um, about any advice that you have about the specific point in time that we are at with the WGA strike just ending, but, you know, SAG still. SAG after is still ongoing. Um, is there anything that you recommend at this specific point in time um, relevant to the, the situation on how we go about trying to put our work out there or sell our scripts and anything you recommend we keep in mind? I wanted to kind of to answer that question like on the bigger one. I think similar to what Xavier was telling about like how to get your projects out there, right? And and giving giving kind of like hope, right, in this very changing world that we're in, you know, particularly this industry that we're in, is I think very often uh, people always go for like what they know. Like, and when I say that, they always think, oh, there's the big five studios and the streamers, like the wonderful Netflix and Amazon studios and so on, right? 
but there are so many other production companies and smaller studios. And, and as like, Xavier was talking about, like the film festivals, it's like, that's the ones, and there's so many more people in that industry. You just don't know about it because they don't get the press, you know, to do it. And trying to partner up with a smaller co-production company, trying to partner up with a smaller distributor, trying to partner up, you know, with, with, these, smaller, with these smaller players is the one where I think you'll probably have a lot more success because if you look at it as, as a pure numbers game, you're going to find a lot more opportunities there. You know, it kind of reminds me of like when I when I graduated from grad school at USC, they were always like they always brought the same companies over. It's like Procter and Gamble and Morgan Stanley, and you know, it was like these big behemoth companies. And and I remember it was like, oh my god, like those are the only options because that's all you kind of hear about. But once I graduated, I realized how like how diverse it was with the types of businesses out there. And it's also the advice I give to people trying to break in the business. I've been, I've been in the studio world for so long, but there's so many times, and you know, you, I know your goal is to kind of eventually get sometimes to the studios because they have the money, you get the, the reach, but a lot of people get their jobs by working for all those satellite businesses around the studios, the creative agencies, the media agencies, the digital agencies, the co production companies. And it's like, it's almost like here's earth, you know, there when things are just that, but then you have all these asteroids going around. People are hopping back and forth when they start an asteroid they, or a smaller you know, agency, they hop to a studio. I've seen people hop back and forth, right? You know, so I think that's where I just kind of like to answer your question in a very long way about it is doing the research and the homework, like Xavier was talking about, but there is actually, it's incredible by how many other resources are out there. It's just, they're kind of like hidden, you know, and it's not those top seven big ones that everyone expects. I'd probably be remiss too if I didn't mention the comic book angle to it all. Um, I mean, that's certainly, it, you know, it's a it's a more costly way to go about it because it requires finding an artist and getting something made that way. But that's another way to sort of get your story told in a visual medium that still becomes nice workable shorthand for studios and for development execs to look at. I think it's too soon post anything to, to know what the landscape is going to be. I mean, I think it's going to be a sort of flat landscape for a little while while everything sort of shakes out and while there's backlogs of content and so on. So I think being able to tell your story in these other formats and these other mediums potentially gives you other inroads to telling your story and hopefully getting it seen in ways that you may not be able to if you're just working on pitches. Um, I also don't know if comic book content is going to be the same feeder for Hollywood that it has been, just because we're also reaching kind of a lull of comic book content is very much the same and sort of not at its peak right now. So I think until that finds a new sort of plateau to hit, I don't know that it will have the same impact, but it's certainly another outlet you can take to, uh, to tell your story in the meantime. And I would say, just to, to add on to what they were saying, take a moment, this is for everybody, to like find like 10 production companies that aren't Ryan Murphy or J.J. Abrams or anything like that, right? But find some of those, because the, from a business standpoint, the production companies that, that have the model right, non-scripted, reality TV, and docs, there's so many production companies in like LA alone that are constantly pitching to the major studios and networks. They have those relationships. These studios and networks aren't actually going out to create that content. They're literally just buying it from smaller production companies that make a name for themselves that have some office in Santa Monica. And they're like, here goes a doc on this and here goes a doc on that. Or what about this reality TV show about selling houses on sunset? You know, like, come up find do do that research and find some of those smaller production companies that are that have relationships with these studios that you want you'd be surprised wow you guys my brain is full this is <laughs> awesome this is awesome i'm so excited that we got to come here tonight and have this amazing chat and record it so we can look back at it later and understand the information we were just given all these just nuggets of gold. You guys, you're so amazing. Thank you so much. Save your buyers, everybody. <laughs> Woo -hoo -hoo. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Without you guys, we're just having some coffee. So you guys made this event possible. Thank you so much. 
network, 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 but get up because we're going to have to move the chairs and stuff back pretty soon, too. Yeah, inside. Okay. I think it's like, That's yeah, physical thank, production. Yeah, thanks, physical to second home, production. thanks to the second home. And yes. Head inside more because they, they have to kind of clear this out. Yeah. So, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. We love to hear what people's feedback is. We love to hear what else you want to learn about. We have put on so many panels because people said, you know, I really want to learn about this. Sweet, let's do it. Come on in. Let's learn, everybody. Educate, empower, succeed. That's what we're all about.